Greetings to everyone. Okay. Now begin with the session. <clears throat> Greetings to everyone. The Department of English and Public Relations of Rajiv Gandhi National University of Law, Punjab, welcomes everyone to the Interdisciplinary International Conference on Literature, Environment, and Climate Change. The conference is being organized in collaboration with the Punjab Pollution Control Board, Patiala, Shastri Indo-Canadian Institute, New Delhi, and Assam Don Bosco University. I would like to thank all the collaborators for joining us today. I would like to specially thank the chief guest, Dr. Adarsh Palvik, Chairman Punjab Pollution Control Board, Patiala. Guest of honor, Dr. Pranchi Kaul, Director of Shastri Indo-Canadian Institute, New Delhi. And special guest, Father Joseph Nalanak. We are also grateful to Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Dr. G.S. Pajpai, and Registrar Dr. Naresh Kumar Vats for joining us today. The keynote speaker for the inaugural session is Dr. Richard Pickard. Professor at the Department of English, University of Victoria, Canada. I would now like to invite and call upon the Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Dr. G.S. Pajpai, to say a few words. Very good morning, all the guests for this morning to this uh, very important program on International Interdisciplinary Conference on literature, environment, and climate change being organized in collaboration with Punjab Pollution Control Board, Shastri Indo-Canadian Institute, New Delhi, and Assam Don Bosco University. It is my pleasure to really acknowledge the presence of some very distinguished guests today morning, especially the chief guest, Professor Dr. Adarsh Pal, Chairman uh, Punjab Pollution Control Board. Also, the guest of honor, Dr. Prachiko, Director, Shastri Indo Canadian Institute, and also some very distinguished, uh, you know, speakers and uh, keynote speakers, uh, uh, which I can see that uh, Professor uh, Dr. Richard Pickard would be speaking this morning, and also uh, Ms. Reshma Rana and Dr. Stephen. In many more people who are joining today as a part of this very important gathering, uh, where I can see lots of uh, experts, researchers, academicians, activists, they are joining hands to uh, debate and discuss on the theme which has been very carefully chosen, focusing on literature, environment, and climate change. Uh, as far as as far as Rajiv Gandhi National Law University uh, Pachab is concerned, uh, this university was set up by the National University of Law Punjab Act 2006. And this university since then has been, uh, you know, has been working very diligently to assume a role of uh, frontline uh, teaching and research institutions in the field of law, accredited with the uh, a grade by the National uh, you know, NAC Council. And also uh, in the recent past, the university has registered its significant presence on account of its seminal contributions to a variety of interdisciplinary areas through its teaching, discourses, research activities. I'm very happy to say that as many as 20 advanced centers of research uh, are working in this university to ensure uh, an effective dialogue and discourse on some cutting edge areas having interface with the field of law. So therefore, I feel that over the years, some of these issues, which were not solely in the domain of legal studies are now becoming the part of uh, important discourse. And it's a very important development that the law universities are significantly paying attention to those social issues which have a drastic bearing 
on the day-to-day -day living of the people. And today I can see that such a theme featuring in our discourse today. And this becomes a lot more important because we have the, we are doing this in the partnership of Punjab Pollution Control Board. And we are also in the process of uh, expanding our collaboration with uh, Punjab Pollution Control Board in terms of organizing various other engagements. This may be training, this may be some research activities to be able to make it uh, a more meaningful contribution. Uh, I also feel that the issue that you are focusing, though there are subject experts to speak on that subject, but climate change is something which is becoming so crucial for the human existence as such. And as we gather that the international fora and also the domestic legislation and domestic uh, institutions are now wearing to look at and uh, this particular issue in terms of uh, intervening it at appropriate stages and also in terms of shaping the policy discourses with regard to the subjects. In the field of law, what we actually uh, express that uh, we are actually emphasizing what we call environmental justice and de de debate and discourse with regard to environmental justice are growing very significantly. And uh, I'm also aware that uh, this particular, uh, you know, uh, program is being, uh, you know, launched, conceptualized and organized by the Department of uh, English and uh, other social science departments are also partnering. So therefore, they have also focused the theme of literature into it. Uh, I think uh, this makes this gathering and this program uh, quite interesting. So I'm quite eager to listen how this particular theme is featuring in some, you know, uh, important writings of different authors. And uh, so I convey my greetings to all the partners, to all the stakeholders, and I'm sure that uh, your discussion would you know, uh, would result into some meaningful recommendations and we would try to pursue them appropriately through our channels. But I again Please. thank you profusely to all of you uh, for your presence today. And I'm looking forward to hear uh, your presentation today. My greetings to you, good best wishes and welcome to this uh, interaction. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir, for that address. I would now like to invite Dr. Navleen Multani, Assistant Professor of the Department of English, to share the vision of the conference with us today. Very good morning to everyone. Are we able to understand this? Yes, ma'am, you are audible. All right, thank you so much. Uh, well, the Vice Chancellor, RDN, your Professor G.S. Patpai, respected Dr. Adarsh Pal, uh, with Chairman, Punjab Pollution Control Board, Patiala, Venerable Dr. Prachi Paul, Director, Shastri Indo Canadian Institute, New Delhi, uh, Reverend Father Stephen Mevli in absentia, and the Vice Chancellor of Sam Don Bosco University, Father Joseph Nelant, uh, the Pro Vice Chancellor of Sam Don Bosco University. Professor Richard Pickett, keynote speaker, University of Victoria, Canada. Uh, Ms. Reshma Rana, program officer, Sikhi. Professor Sajinder Kaur, Dr. Sai K. Banerjee, uh, Department of English, Assam, Don Bosco University. Professor Naresh Kumar, work in absentia. Uh, distinguished speakers, I can see Professor Dipendu has joined us. I can also see a few more plenary speakers who have uh, joined us for the inaugural. Uh, academicians, colleagues, research scholars, uh, PR of Punjab Pollution Control Board, Vicky Bansal, the law officer, Sumiti Rokwal, and uh, my dear students, a pleasant morning to you all. The earth is what we all have in common, and it is our collective and individual responsibility to preserve and tend to the world in which we live. So the words, uh, 
we, we might be living apart, you know, we are connecting from different places, uh, whether it is in India or um, like as we were talking two days ago with uh, Professor Richard Pickett, that would people, the audience in India be interested in knowing about the places and the geographical areas in British Columbia or any other place uh, in Canada. So we all have a collective as well as an individual responsibility to protect air, water, wilderness, wildlife, and of, of course, the human being. And that is why we are all here connecting from our GNL campus on Cisco WebEx to deliberate uh, and address the climatic changes and also to exhibit a kind of a solidarity which is actually required to bring any kind of change that can happen. In the recent times, so the environmental crisis and then climate change have led to the emergence of a number of stories about the planet. So uh, these stories, whether you know they are from India or they are from abroad, have a long-lasting impact on the mind of, of whether we are students or we are researchers or we are academicians or we are people who are holding positions and we are capable of bringing some changes through our policies and certain other rules and regulations. If I talk about uh, literature in the field of ecocriticism, it is extending its focus from the formal narratives uh, to the non-human narratives on environment and an interdisciplinary encounter between the social sciences and narrative theory that attempts to study the everyday climate and the consequences of the climate change on humanity is very central to the conference. And that is the con what the conference is about. This uh, cross fertilization also sheds light on the climate change and its potentially deadly impact on the ecosystem of the Earth. While the literary scholarship maps the experiences of human suffering and consequences of climate change on various spatial temporal scales, the metaphorical language that abounds in the literature on climate change is very central to the discourses which we are talking about today. And it has been talked about the word oak. So the literary language, uh, though, you know, um, again, you know, this reminds me of the words of uh, W.H. Um, whether poetry can make something happen. But yes, the literary language with creative metaphors is the human emotions and blend these with new perspectives over the fate of the planet. The broad gamut of the effective engagement with natural world is also entangled at various level with culture and as we have received papers from different corners of the world all those presentations are going to focus and bring to our attention what's happening with which culture which geographical area and what efforts have been made and yes i remember while i was speaking to uh, dr adarshpal vig in his office you know uh, when we went with this idea that we are going to conduct um, a conference he had one very important question. What is going to be the outcome of this conference? So, uh, yes, definitely we are going to deliberate and we are going to, you know, come across uh, as the presenters will be making their presentations, come across the catastrophic narratives, whether in fiction or non-fiction, which are feeding the imagination of the writers to bring to the fore all the kind of natural disasters uh, which have already you know destroyed a major chunk of mother earth and also you know it's an effort through these deliberations to modulate and cultivate our biophilic impulses uh, as we begin today during this inaugural i just would like to bring your attention to what in the silent spring in the year 1962 had alerted a large audience about. She alerted the large audience about the environmental and human dangers, about the indiscriminate use of pesticides, sparring revolutionary changes in the laws affecting our air, land, and water. 
The publication of this book was a watershed moment, uh, which now probably is the foundational 21st century text for the environmental studies. While uh, Carson was greatly talking about the indiscriminate use of these pesticides, she was she was capable of galvanizing in the 1960s a movement against the indiscriminate use of the DDT. And her rhetoric today in the 21st century reads as a moralistic text, you know, which shows us a road of reason. If I just bring the words of Rob Dunn, an evolutionary biologist, he says, uh, we cannot deny the fact that the disciplines are influencing each other. He writes, Silent Spring lit a basin that continues to burn even today. The book has shifted the public discourse about environment, progress, and has suggested means for making human life better. So Carson's painting of the worst case scenarios uh, and the description of the apocalyptic scenes about the thousands of dead raptors, birds, was not an advocacy to end the use of DDT, but was an exhortation to reconsider the use of pesticides, especially the strongest ones. Carson calls for new forms of pest controls, genetic management, and better technological approaches to manage nature with caution and care. So the reading of this remarkable book, you know, gives us insight and, and really shakes us out of our slumber and inaction uh, because of which we have not been able to contribute much to what is required for the, the efforts that have to take place to control the climate change that is part of us. So the ecological uh, repercussions of the changing climatic conditions uh, have from time to time been unfolding a number of environmental shocks and hazards. The warming of the globe it's again a global phenomena, and we all know that today in the month of April, when we are sitting in our in this uh, conference hall and connecting from different parts of the world, we already are witnessing a rise in the temperature, which probably we have not been able to control. And I think we are the only generation, you know, is capable of doing this, or else the harsh winters, the severe summers, or the intermittent rain that have been a common phenomena everywhere, you know, are going to be a great threat to humanity. The 2021 uh, United Nations Climate Change Conference also needs a mention here as we begin uh, with the conference, because this conference held in Glasgow has revealed to us that the state of political will in the world is again, 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 not a stable one, which can show a direction. Neoliberal governance in the contemporary times thrives by taking advantage of the social confusion that is shown by the predicted crisis. We already witnessed one. The contagion was with us in the last two years, and we are still suffering the after effects of that. This uh, failure of the politicians and the lack of social action is responsible for the constant environmental degradation. But this is not to say that we are not the contributors to that degradation. We also, in one way or the other, are doing that. And uh, as our chief guest, uh, Chairman Pollution Control Board, joined us today, the first thing that he did was he made us remove all the plastic elements articles that were lying on the table, right? So this is how the change has to happen. So uh, whether the psychologist, the sociologist, or the cognitive scientist, they have offered uh, various recommendations, but there has been a human inability to act on this. And uh, again, trying to understand this, we need to go back to Aristotle, who says this is a weakness of will. Failure of the agent to do, you know, what he or she is capable of. This, uh, the state of affairs at the summit in the United, uh, United Nations Climate Change Conference also shows how uh, the politicians are hobbled by their corporate vested interests and are restricted. Even the individuals are restricted only to their individual gains and self-interest. Therefore, the general good has remained unaccomplished. I would uh, like to conclude my remarks uh, by quoting Naomi Klein, who in her recently published book, This Changes Everything, brings to the fore 
and identifies a way in which you know we can proceed further and take care of the planet. She says that this cannot happen without the popular interest and eco consciousness being raised. So uh, her vision of environmental social social change adopts the approach of the of the progressive way, namely hope. Hope sustains life, and she says uh, through this hope and non-violent action can we we can organize the popular protest to gain sufficient momentum to overcome the sclerotic state and all the manipulations and wrong ways that the global corporates have adopted to pollute the earth or bring about more and more environmental degradation. So in the absence of any coherent alternative, hope is what you know is binding us together and we are here to deliberate upon uh, the effects and also some solutions probably are going to come up. And yes, uh, we are going to be those agents of change who are going to initiate in one way or other something at the individual level to bring about that improvement which is required and make a contribution in controlling this uh, climatic changes that are happening. And so therefore, you know what all we can say, we can say, let's all strive, think and make an effort to have clean air, blue sky and really earth for them. Okay, thank you so much, ma'am. I would like to call upon ma'am to introduce the chief guest for today's session, Dr. Adarsh Palvik, Chairman Punjab Pollution Control Board, Patiala. Thank you, Sama. It is my honor to introduce to you all uh, our chief guest on the occasion of the inaugural ceremony of the Conference Literature, Environment and Climate Change, Dr. Adarsh Palvik. Um, he is the chairman of Punjab Pollution Control Board, Patiala. He is a renowned environmentalist and an able administrator. He formerly was the professor and head with the Department of uh, Botanical and Environmental Sciences at Guru Nanak Dev University, Amritsar. He's also the president of Vigyan Parishad Panchnar. Dr. Vig is having a teaching and research experience of more than 27 years. He has 118 publications at national and international level journals. Uh, with impact factor, the H index, he has supervised 13 plus 7 PhD students. He has so many uh, achievements uh, to his record. He has been awarded the Distinguished Teachers Award in 2012 and the Environmentalist of the Year 2016 and 2018. He has also served as the Director of UGC Human Resource Development Center and the Project Coordinator for Rashtriya Uttar Shiksha Abhyan at GND. Sir, <laughs> sir is a man with a vision and he brings uh, to education, brings in education something you know which you can serve uh, nature. So his uh, most of his work, you know, in Burmi composting and startups. Uh, yes, I need to make a special mention. Though sir is asking me to. I cannot because he has contributed to uh, opening up opening up of new startups on worm composting in various institutes and educational in, uh, educational institutes, colleges, schools, and even villages. That has proved a very fruitful exercise in providing some training and research to students. So we see that, uh, and yes, uh, he is a man with a vision, and I have to read this out. He has emphasized that change is at the individual level. And it is this is the only way you know in which we can control the environmental situation. So I now request uh, Dr. Adarsh Palve to share his thoughts with the audience. Thank you, thank you, uh, Dr. Navleen, for very well placing the uh, theme of the conference as well as introducing me, uh, respected Vice Chancellor Dr. D. S. Bajpai. The distinguished uh, speakers, guests, uh, and uh, organizers, especially of this university and other collaborators, and the most important, the young uh, students or the budding uh, law graduates or uh, lawyers 
of the country as well as uh, all the distinguished persons uh, joined within the country as well as outside the country which has given this uh, online opportunity to interact uh, apart from the boundaries so this is the good part of the you can say the crisis which we have faced uh, in the few years uh, so thank you all of you <coughs> Uh, for uh, being a part of this uh, very prestigious uh, institution, the prestigious conference, and all of you, the famous personalities, who will be definitely doing much at their own level, as well as contributing to the betterment of the society, as, and especially for the environment. Uh, so first of all, I am uh, again uh, very much interested to come to this university because being in the state of Punjab and being in education for so many years and as a part of my uh, institute, Guru Nanak Dev University, I was happy that my colleague, Dr. Gurjeet Singh, whose uh, photo is there, <laughs> he was the first vice chancellor. He was there in uh, Guru Nanak Dev University as a professor of law and uh, we have interacted with him. but. Uh, sorry, he is no more now with us, but he was there to establish this uh, prestigious institute. So I also pay my respect and respect to all other uh, vice chancellors as well as present vice chancellors who is contributing because this was the first law university of the uh, state. Now we have a second one in Tarantan as well. So uh, law is always important for all the aspects. So naturally now the conference is mainly of the theme related to environment, but being the organizers mainly from the law. So I think uh, two aspects I will try to emphasize uh, because environment as such is very, very big issues as uh, Dr. Navaleen has highlighted all the issues. So whenever I uh, will interact with the audience, or anybody or being in the chair at, at a pollution control board. So now the situation uh, is like that. We need not to monitor the environmental degradation. We not need to assess any kind of uh, means uh, degradation or any kinds of climate change. Everything is visible in front of us, everything. Rather, I will say, instead of asking scientists or asking the experts of environmental or other anybody, even the smaller children, every who is coming up in your homes as new uh, budding students or young children, they are everyone knowing, everyone knows that air is being polluted, water is being polluted, <laughs> soil is being polluted. So, at this stage, there is no need to do much more on analysis part or observation part. So my only emphasis is now the time is to find the solutions. The time is to find that what, how this can be stopped. So in that sense, I have always two answers for that which sometimes we are not doing because it is all because of pollution that this word pollution was not earlier there you were studying environment you were studying nature you were studying so many other things rather nobody was caring about all these things then a word pollution comes and then pollution means sometimes it's only water or air but now the pollution word has crossed the limit so everything climate change global warming everything has been included in that part what is pollution? Pollution means when uh, you are using uh, out of the limit. You are exploiting the nature out of the limit. So this is the pollution. Otherwise, uh, there is no such pollution. So then who is doing all these things? Who is the culprit? So then <laughs> she has just highlighted. Uh, sometimes we are blaming the culprit, maybe the government culprit or the mainly sometimes we say laws are also culprit. There are no such laws uh, are there. Laws should be strong and everything like that. And uh, other, uh, the, our education may be the culprit. So we are trying to find the, you can say, reasons that whom we should blame. <laughs> sometimes we feel that uh, means uh, 
I feel that I have not done anything. It may be my ancestors or something you always want to blame. Or maybe some sometime it is between developed countries and uh, this uh, developed, uh, developing countries or poor and rich and so many things we are deliberate. So we only want to give a blame. Sometimes we say big cities, one, one, sometimes we say agriculture, sometimes because of pesticides, sometimes we say uh, the industrialization, urbanization, everything. So like uh, these, everyone is contributor, but the main, I think on the, the culprit is the human. <laughs> So even children, rather I feel even I am, if I say I human, it means I first point the finger towards me. Being Adarshpal, I am the contributor in the pollution. It should be otherwise. I should have contributed in the protection of the nature, which I did not. I should be towards the conservation of the enhancement of the natural sources. We the one thing is that, uh, then, then others will ask this the question that why then these natural forces are there? They are for use. Of course, this is the question. They are always for use. Still, they are for use, but not for misuse. I am no, nobody is against of the use of water, but no, you should not pollute water. Nobody is against to use the fresh air, but you are not uh, means uh, you are not allowed to pollute the air. You are to do agriculture, but you are not to pollute the agriculture. You are to do the industrialization, but not at the cost of giving harm to the any natural resource, maybe it's water or air or whatsoever. So that uh, thin line of uh, difference of use or misuse, I think that has created the problem. And I'm very thankful that I belong to a culture and because international persons are here, the Indian culture was blamed like that they are worshipping nature. So I think that worship sense was for the protection of the nature. And still it is there. And I will request all the distinguished persons, you must study the Indian. It's not saying that others or other religions or other, they are not doing, but I feel this is more towards the nature. So they were blamed like they are uh, having pawns on the uh, this uh, their religious places. They were uh, worshipping the trees. They were worshipping the sun. They were worshipping the means the moon and other things. So the, like like that. But and they were said that they they are old uh, means they they want to have something from the god. Because in Indian culture, why the fear of God is required? Now, now we are having a fear of law. So above law is God. So God fear is always very, very important. Very, very important. So at the Indian culture says that means they are all gods. Water is God. Pavan Guru, Pani Pita, Mata, Tartamhar. So those uh, writings in Vedas, in our Guru Granth Sahib, in everywhere. And they were, the word was worship. But practically, it was meaning of protection of those natural resources. And use of that natural resources is still allowed. It is allowed, but not exploitation. You can do agriculture, you can do industrialization, but not at the cost of the environmental degradation. Rather, duty of the humans were to enhance those natural resources. I, now, I will not use the word protection of natural resources. Now, the duty has to be these natural sources should be enhanced. Like we, we were studying uh, uh, deforestation and other things, afforestation should be there, but nobody has done afforestation. Wildlife protection should be there, but nobody means we have other exploited. Water, pure water, which is rain water, should be available, but now we are depending on bottled water. So, so many commercial angles and so many issues have been there. So uh, this is just a, a highlight of the issues, but then how to, to correct it? So how to correct it? So firstly, I say that no blame game, uh, no question of who is doing, but feel that I am doing. It is my responsibility. I even not use word we. It is not we. We are sitting eight or ten here. 
It's not we responsible. It's, it is my other spouse responsible. So I will change my lifestyle. I will change my working wherever, even if I am a government, even I am an industrialist, even if I am an agriculturalist. So if I will correct myself, even I am a household person. So I will not pollute the natural resources. I will not use a lifestyle or a business or an income which is going to pollute. You have to, because you, you are doing and you are not remembering this. Indian culture was reuse culture. You, we have entered into use and throw culture. Those rivers and the ponds, they were given amrit. Water was amrit. And we have not, you know, we are saying that this is polluted water. And we need a bottle of water. So we are not satisfied with the air outside the camp in the, in the greener area. We are comfortable with the air of the uh, air condition. So I think I should change my lifestyle. So that is the, I think, yeah, the young students are sitting here. So I request them. <laughs> so, so exploitation is not, I, this is me who has to change, not we even. So I will change and then I think uh, that yeah. thing, it is very difficult to talk of this thing as I am doing today, but it is very difficult to follow this. My dear students, or all the learner distinguished. Even I feel that I have no right to speak on any environmental issues if I have not adopted all those corrective measures in my daily life. Uh, she has rightly said I was not able to comfortable because if I will not say no to uh, pollution or no to plastic, then who else will say? Why? So then the question comes sometimes, uh, this is the duty of government, this is there, the law should be there. Now I will relate with the law. That law should be there to ban the plastic and then uh, law should be there not to pollute the air. Law should be there not to put the pesticide. Law. So, <laughs> so do you know, in India especially or maybe all over the world, there are hundreds or thousands of law and every day new law is coming. As I was talking of pollution in India, I recently has done a ban on single-use plastic from July 2020. So all over, earlier it was, the plastic ban was already, no, the single-use plastic. Solid waste ban, uh, electronic waste ban. So water, then, then we are, that it, Water Act was in 1974 when this pollution board came into existence. And our name is Pollution Control. The, the control word was there, but how could I control? <laughs> so laws are one part. The second part is the culture. Second part is the means self, which I have already talked. Second part is how you are educated, like she was talking about the education. In 1995, in India, Supreme Court has uh, uh, made it compulsory to study environmental course, six month module. But when it was started, so everybody, what is the need? Why we are putting, I, we belong to commerce field, we belong to computer field. Why you are studying environment? So this, this was still, I think, when our students go for teaching of the environment in the other department, so they say, and it, it should not be credited in the marks, so, so many things. So then I request my students who are teacher now, that you should not <laughs> make them fear of the course. You should attach them with the nature. So they are doing it. So I think that has also given, uh, uh, has brought a change as well. So still it is required and still we are doing. So law is one part, one pillar and the self is the other. So laws should be there. It's not that this, this, this should be go parallel hand in hand. It's otherwise if the law, but it's not that you should say the first law should come, then I will change myself. So my request is that, that culture, that uh, your feeling that 
इन गुरु ग्रंथ साहब इसे सर्वदा बला गुरुवंतो विश्व मार्यम ऑल आर वन यूनिवर्स इज फुल सो देयर इज नो बाउंड्रीज फॉर एयर देयर इज नो बाउंड्री फॉर लैंड फिजिकली इट मे बी बट एवरी लैंड इज फॉर गिविंग यू फूड सो एयर इज टू गिव यू द रेस्पिर टू हैव दिस काइंड ऑफ मींस यू हैव टू लिव देयर so these natural resources are common or has to be shared so uh, then i think if you say about law so i have already told so many laws are there at last in india maybe in other countries now the ngt i think if you all students are knowing national green tribunal and every day so many orders are coming from national green tribunal so they can only pass orders but implementation again rest with the self So I think we self is very important. So law that there are crores of fines to industries, to government department, to others. There are crores of because law is there. If you are not doing, so one step is fine. Second step is the litigation, and third step maybe in you can go into the jail or something like. But but ultimately, if they are not, so in, for environment especially, the law is for other so many other crimes or things are there, but. for environmental so that kind of uh, self realization self motivation and through education so many means are there the religious books our culture so we should be more you can say i sometimes say a uh, scientist or technologist or the engineering kind of thing they have destroyed the world in terms of making new technologies <laughs> so there is a technology to extract water so many you can go bore 600 foot you can go 700 you can do extraction but when i ask that is you have to do the rain water harvesting they say there is no such technology <laughs> how will apply why should we do it so then ultimately the ground water will finish you have all technologies to pollute the air but not to restrict now you are using filter and other things and so many things are there so definitely law is very important ngt is there and ngt rules so it means i am saying how from simple laws and so many uh, then they are there but ultimately they are very important it's not that they should not be there so you are part of that you are all graduates you are studying so i rather request you all the students that you should now have more emphasis to our, towards environmental law and sometimes we are not having experts of environmental law so that way i physically came here to interact with the vice chancellor as well as the other faculty so that uh, the environmental experts are also required but ultimately my request is that or my feeling is that uh, the individual change or uh, uh, the self realization or that i will correct myself and i can correct and uh, if i will change the other things will change so i think with this little uh, request i would say i am very thankful to the organizers to all the participant for uh, deliberating and for interacting for uh, this wonderful topic thank you good day thank you sir thank you thank you, thank you so much sir thank you so much the guest of honor for today's session is dr prachi gol director of shastri indo canadian institute new delhi Dr. Prachi Kaul has been the director of Shastri Indo-Canadian Institute for its office in India. She has been associated with the institute for more than 17 years. An alumna of IIT Delhi, Dr. Kaul has served and associated with various international and national bodies like World Bank, Asian Development Bank, UNESCO, Plan International, and National University of Educational Planning and Administration before joining the Shastri Institute. I would now like to call upon ma'am to share a few words with the guest today. Thank you so very much. Uh, very good morning everyone. Uh, and good evening uh, to our guest from University of Victoria. Very warm welcome to you. I uh, I understand that it's going to be pretty late for you, but I really appreciate you joining the session that that presents your uh, Uh, you know willingness to support such initiatives thanks so much uh, esteemed panel uh, and uh, faculty researchers honorable vice chancellors 
and uh, uh, the coordinator of the event, young students and researchers, most importantly. Uh, it's a delight for me to be here with you uh, uh, for this opening session of the conference, which is, uh, which is, I would say, is most uh, prevalent issue in current times, uh, because it, it connects from various issues, not just literature, environment, uh, and health, but also uh, angles that uh, that are important for all of us in today's context. Uh, I would say that uh, uh, it's it's wonderful to see that you have brought in, and this being a law university, I'm sure there are going to be. Uh, it's a truly, truly multi uh, multidisciplinary approach that you have adopted by bringing literature and environment together. But uh, uh, I'm sure there are going to be other disciplines being discussed and deliberated. The perspectives who are going to be built from uh, all the corners and all the disciplines and all the subject areas to make it more comprehensive in approach. Uh, what is uh, important for me to uh, share with you that I come from uh, uh, Shastri Indo-Canadian Institute, uh, which is a Binational organization. Uh, your university is the esteemed member of Shastri Indo Canadian Institute, and we are very uh, proud of that fact. Uh, we are looking forward to engage more meaningfully in the in not just in this area, but in the areas that are quite relevant uh, to our bilateral corridor between India and Canada. Uh, what we do is uh, provide, you know, if uh, this uh, this uh, uh, this important gathering. Uh, have uh, less information about or not so well equipped with the information on Shastri. I would say we are a binational organization mandated by both the governments, the uh, government of India and Canada. We have a wide network of institutions that are on board. Uh, uh, from India side, we have around 130 institutions. You name a good institute and good university is on our board. Uh, similarly, from the Canadian side, we have a prestigious uh, 40 institutions uh, that are part of our network. What we are trying to do is to build connections uh, and uh, the connections and collaborations and partnerships. And this important job is done by two, mean, by two means primarily. One is by providing uh, assistance to uh, financial assistance, I would say, uh, to take up issues of relevance like the one that is happening today. Uh, and uh, uh, what we do is we reach out to the uh, each and every component of academia and research fraternity, uh, starting from undergrad students. So you students who are uh, present today should necessarily explore uh, the opportunities to be in Canada for an internship or for uh, exploring a fellowship that can make you be there for up to six months time and uh, spend some time with an university wherein, uh, why not with the University of Victoria for that matter, and you can work with the professor who's here joining us. Uh, and, and you know, this, this will give you a broader perspective what is happening at the global level, uh, Canada being very, very sensitive and proactive as India is in terms of environment and its uh, conservation. I'm sure the compatibility and the complementarity that you will witness uh, from the Canadian end is going to be amazing for you as a learning experience. Similarly, I would encourage all the faculty members to look for the grants that we have and our partners have uh, to explore uh, building connections, uh, uh, you can build up a course on this particular issue, you can co-teach a course in each other's campus, uh, you can offer a series of workshops or seminars or uh, do so many things together. So it's an opportunity that you have uh, uh, for, through Shastri to uh, be together and uh, uh, make it a common cause and make it uh, work out very well. So this is one, and there's, uh, there are other opportunities by uh, submitting your proposal towards collaborative research and uh, asking for program, program development grants. So there's no arena uh, that remains untouched by Shastri on a, to serve the academia and research fraternity of our member institution. This is one way of supporting these endeavors. Uh, however, the most important and uh, in, uh, the, the angle that I want to present to you is building connections and collaborations. And that is what the niche is uh, with us. So if you are interested in collaboration, you reach out to us or uh, any university from Canada is interested to reach out to Indian Institution of Excellence, reach out to Shastri Institute. What we are trying to do is uh, bring you together uh, we are trying to map and match, and then we are trying to facilitate uh, the collaboration as well through various sources. So that is that's that remains most important uh, for us to facilitate on the bilateral corridors. Uh, 
uh, coming down to you know uh, today's issue uh, i think uh, we all have a responsibility as a stakeholder uh, as our previous uh, chief guest has just mentioned that uh, uh, it's me who's responsible for preservation and conservation of the environment uh, i would say that uh, i as an uh, individual i as a prachi call remain responsible and conscious on my doings and uh, not doing so uh, especially the younger researchers and students a lot of responsibility lies with you because uh, you must explore the ways where you can curb and uh, i would say even a tiny slightest uh, you know effort from our side even leaving the room and uh, switching off the fan or switching off the light is a great contribution to uh, conserve and preserve the energy uh, similarly there are other ways as our speaker before uh, has mentioned about so it is important to understand that we are the stakeholders here we are the stakeholders to conserve it so greater responsibility lies with us the human and uh, much uh, is being done already by the states and federal governments uh, at both the ends in india and canada but that is not going to be enough unless we as a human are uh, feel responsible and take it this uh, take this forward today is a important day today is a world health day actually and uh, as you know this directly affects to the issue that uh, we are discussing so the state of our environment and planet earth uh, you know it kind of directly uh, affects and determines the state of uh, us the human and our well being too so to mark the occasion of the world health day we are organizing uh, uh, or we would say we are bringing together distinguished leader in healthcare and uh, research to discuss and uh, share opportunities and challenges uh, that we are witnessing today and also to build a resilience uh, for uh, tomorrow so top leadership from canada like uh, professor michael strong who's the uh, president of cihr canada in uh, health research institute dr uh, guleria who's director of all india institute of medical sciences uh, president of university of sherbrooke are going to be uh, with us and uh, talking about uh, issues that concerns all of us and how india and canada can engage on this very important topic so uh, this is uh, i request my colleague ms rana to share the details in the chat box if possible so that uh, those who are interested uh, may like to join it is starting at 8 pm tonight so if you wish you can join it's going to be a very interesting session uh, with that i am not going to take long i wish you all the very best a uh, wonderful coordination of the inaugural session and i'm sure uh, it's going to be uh, uh, quite enriching and capacity building Uh, uh, uh sessions throughout this conference for the younger lot of researchers especially as well as the young faculty who are going to take it forward who who are going to shoulder the responsibility on behalf of institutions and as a nation as well congratulations once again and uh, uh, it was honored to be with all of you uh, my best wishes and take care of yourself thank you thank you so much ma'am I would now like to invite our special guest, Father Joseph Melanat, Pro Vice Chancellor, Assam Don Bosco University, to share a few words with the audience today. Thank you. A warm good morning to you all participants. Greetings from Assam Don Bosco University. This conference on literature, environment, and climate change. has as its backdrop the urbanization and modernization that have greatly influenced the interaction between man and environment in the recent times man's exploitation of nature and her resources indiscriminately is responsible for the environmental crisis of the planet earth the excessive consumption of scarce resources huge amount of garbage ozone layer depletion and various types of pollution and extinction of species are among the major environmental problems this is where environmental literature has a role to play it can focus on the interconnectedness 
between living beings and their surroundings. Environmental education can sensitize one and all regarding the efforts and skills required to improve the quality of the ecosystem. Today, perhaps we need authors like H.G. Wells, Arthur C. Clarke, Jules Verne, or Mary Shelley to bring out novels and climate fiction books that focus on climate change. Climate change has caused a lot of environmental imbalance. In order to educate people on the importance of climate change, others can create fiction stories to bring out the gravity of the problem. Reading a short story about climate change increases people's climate concern, according to a new study. The effect is temporary, but in combination with other messages, reading fiction could make a real difference in shifting public attitudes about climate change. Such stories on climate change or stories about global warming can play with the idea of how humanity will deal with a climate disaster in a world similar to our own. Fiction can encourage empathy and imagination. Stories can affect us more than dry facts. Good stories will appeal to the hearts of readers. Environmental themes can reorient our perspective from egocentrism to the greater than human world. To substantiate this view, I would like to refer to a study by a group of researchers. They recruited 1,000 294 participants through an online platform. Each study participant was randomly assigned to read one of the three following short stories. Number one, in-flight entertainment, a realistic fiction about climate change by Helen Simpson. Number two, The Tamarisk Hunter, a speculative fiction about a dystopian climate change future by Paolo Basigalupi. And number three, Good People, a realistic fiction by David Foster Wallace that doesn't touch on environmental topics. After reading their assigned story, the participants had to answer a questionnaire about climate beliefs and attitudes. Even though the two climate fiction stories were very different, they both increased the climate concern of the readers. Those who read either of the two climate fiction stories were more worried about how climate change would affect their own life and the lives of future generations compared to those who read the third story. They were also more likely to say that climate change will cause more droughts, poverty, and refugees. In a real world, any given bit of climate fiction is likely to be only one of the many messages about climate change that a person encounters. And the researchers write, effects of a single message tend to dissipate, but repeated messages can cause the effects to stick. Eco-criticism explores the environmental dimensions of literature. 
eco criticism converges with his sister disciplines in humanities history anthropology philosophy ethics law religious studies political science geography sociology and others to understand the ethics of human environmental interactions lawrence buell traces environmental imagination and ecological ethics in the literary works of various american writers he asserts that discourses on landscapes and toxicity can propel transformation in the environmental consciousness this conference has the following objectives to facilitate discussion on climate change its impact on the environment and literature related aspects to create a common platform for officials academicians researchers and experts in order to bridge the gap between academic wisdom and practical knowledge and lastly to work in coordinates with subject matter experts and understand the need for literature to generate eco consciousness in our society let me wish the participants of this conference a very enriching experience enabling you to become change makers for safeguarding our environment and our planet earth have a great day thank you thank you so much sir i would now like to call upon ms reshma rana verma program officer shastri indo canadian institute new delhi to introduce the keynote speaker for today dr richard pickard you are muted reshma <laughs> not audible no sorry reshma we can't hear you would you like to run down upstairs run down up fast you sorry for the glitch it's okay ma'am Reshma ma ma'am can you just unmute your unmute your tab she's a registered tab on the phone or else uh, can you write raise the Reshma raise the volume Reshma ma ma'am open the video ma hello hello yes we can hear you now ma'am hello 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 स्विस्ट ऑफ Oh, it's working now. Okay. Well, good morning to all, and uh, my apologies for this glitch. Now it's time to listen to the most important person of the conference, who is the keynote speaker. The role of the keynote speaker is to set the keynote for the conference and to establish the basic tone and tenor of the gathering that resonates through the event. Dr. Richard Pickard, as an assistant professor. in the department of english at the university of victoria he teaches in the areas of environmental humanities composition and professional communications he is a former president of the association for literature environment and culture in canada 
and he hosted UVIC in 2009 by National Conference of the Association for the Study of Literature and Environment and the 2018 Biennial AAECC Conference. His research interests are in the field of environment and literature. 18th century studies especially focused the literature in writing from the about non-urban British Columbia. Increasingly, his work has moved toward considerations of environmental justice <laughs> in the indigenous led land back movement in Canada. In September of this year, he will be teaching a senior undergraduate course entitled Climate Change, Pandemics, and Imagining a Future. Today's talk grows out of his experience in teaching environmental humanities courses on other themes, which have included eco criticism, ecological grief, and human extinctions. I uh, welcome you, uh, Dr. Reiser. Now the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, I want to thank all of you for gathering today. Um, I would uh, I would love to name all of you separately and thank you for your participation. Um, I'm uh, overwhelmed by how many people are in attendance today and I'm um, even more honored by the invitation than I was when it arrived initially. Um, so I want to thank you all for gathering today and for committing your time to this crucial theme of this conference of this conference. Um, as I say, I'm deeply honored by the opportunity to speak to you today. Um, although I continue to worry as I always do with such things that my presentation will not be radical enough. Um, it seems always that um, other speakers at conferences are becoming more radical all the time, and I'm delighted by that. Um, I'm going to uh, try to share a screen with you um, to, so hopefully this will work. Um, this gives you something to look at other than, than simply me for the next half an hour. So as I say, we, I may not be radical enough. We will not be at the barricades quite yet when I surrender the microphone in half an hour. But at this point, all of the work that we are doing should be understood as occurring at one barricade or another. In my own work, that barricade has to do with helping my students to understand the culture that has produced them and the culture that they are themselves producing, a culture that is destroying, as we say, so many elements of of the world that allows us to exist that allows other beings to exist i do i will do my best today to justify your faith in inviting me absolutely i must know that all of us working in this area have a deep sense of inadequacy at times however to the barricades we go together before i go any further i need to follow a relatively recent canadian tradition which we refer to as a territorial acknowledgement. I don't know whether this practice will be familiar to very many of you. There are many ways to do such a thing, but my normal practice is to embed my acknowledgement into whatever activity is underway at the time, be it a talk like this one, a literary studies course, or a non-academic event. Many speakers deliver an acknowledgement and hope that that will inform what happens, but I don't feel that that uh, does justice to the um, crises that we're responding to by developing this practice. And so first I want to offer the formal acknowledgement that the University of Victoria has developed in consultation with local Indigenous elders, which is on screen in front of you. We acknowledge and respect the Lekwungen peoples on whose traditional territory the University stands, and the Songhees, Esquimalt, and Wasanich peoples, whose historical relationships with the land continue to this day. Versions of this statement are offered at all campus events at the University of Victoria, and we're encouraged to carry it with us to other locations as well to make visible the fact of colonization and the hope of decolonization of the lands beneath and surrounding our home university. Without this decolonization, Canada will never be able to help enough in facing these ecological crises that the other speakers today have already alluded to. When I speak elsewhere in Canada, 
or in the United States, I also acknowledge the lands in that place, as well as those indigenous peoples whose lands they were, might still be now, and could be again in the future. The academic world, after all, is overlaid onto a material one, and our would-be transcendent politics can intersect awkwardly with the material politics in operation at particular locations. I should say that this acknowledgement is often um, received somewhat awkwardly in the United States when I speak there. It is, uh, it is not an approach that is familiar to them, um, although it's one they're interested in uh, and have questions about afterwards. For myself, as I say, I never feel that the gesture of acknowledgement is complete without including a personal element to it. Um, indeed, the talk today will cover a lot of ground in relation to, to what decolonization means here. Today, I need to acknowledge two particular peoples and their territories, both of whom are, live some distance from Victoria, where I live and work myself. Foundationally, I would like to recognize the Sichuetmuk peoples, sometimes called the Shushuat peoples. I grew up in the traditional lands of the little Shushuat band myself, but today I think of another Shushuatmuk band, the Nisconlith, from whose numbers came the much lamented George Manuel and his son, Arthur Manuel. I'll always regret, regret that I met neither of these two brilliant leaders. They're thinking about Canadian colonial practices and their importance of land in decolonization has guided much of my work in this area over the last decade, including today's talk. And I'm mindful of the honor that comes from having lived in the territory that sustained them. For this talk specifically, I need to acknowledge as well with gratitude the Skeet Cheston Band, who are also Sichuatmuk peoples, whose territory is centered in an area known as Dead Man Valley. In our imaginations today, we will be spending much of our time together in Dead Man Valley, and I acknowledge the Skeet Cheston for their long stewardship of this place throughout its complicated history and its deeply, deeply shadowed future. I should say that this talk will focus on some very specific small places in British Columbia. I believe very strongly that we need to think carefully about every scale of our vision from the local to the general. I was heartened to hear the, uh, the focus on the individual earlier today. But I hope that you don't mind being carried a long way from India, at least for a short time, to some places that I'm confident you will not have heard of before. To be clear, we are living through overlapping apocalypses at this moment. The brief that I set myself today, though, was to unpack some ways that my students try to imagine a future regardless. This is one reason for stressing the local, and I hope you don't see in this em emphasis on the local a refusal to see the larger crises. I mean it instead as a way of addressing and making sense of those larger crises. So before we speak of, of Dead Man Valley, before we get very far into the concept of eco-criticism, I want to state a principle that anchors much of my work at the intersection of literature and environment. And that is that every reader is the center of their own universe. Every reader is the center of their own universe, the center of their own world. In eco-critical terms, we all have our own places that we know best, that we connect to, that we dream about that form the material substrate beneath our intellectualized questions of environment, ecology, and climate. For any one of us, these places shift over time as we come to live in different locations or come to live differently. But it is important to recognize, nonetheless, that these places are individual, even when we share them. In saying this, I do not mean to reify myths of individualism, be those myths Western, capitalist, psychological, whatever ideology you'd prefer. I want to stress simply that when it comes to the environment, even our most intellectual pursuits have some grounding in individual experiences of place. A good example of this is the concept of shifting baselines, uh, the term that marine biologist Daniel Pauly coined in 1995 to explain why it is that humans simply can't grasp long-term gradual environmental change. This concept of shifting baseline depends on our accurate awareness of what is around us, and that is something that we struggle greatly to manage. 
No matter how clear the historical evidence might be about fisheries landings, or recordings of birdsong, dates of first flowering for different species, concentration of chemicals in a river, the recent past gets labeled normal. And it's against this flawed assumption of normalcy that we come to casually assess pre present environmental health or environmental change, that we misunderstand the signals that we should be seeing. Still, the local aside, when we need explanatory power, we tend to reach in the end for theoretical principles. And in ecocriticism, we often derive these principles from someone else's reading of texts grounded in places far from those that we know. When we are working sensitively enough, this is neither a totalizing nor a globalizing impulse. But I take very seriously Bruce Braun's worries about this point in his book, The Intemperate Rainforest. A term like temperate rainforest, in Braun's view, does not name a static set of cultural and ecological relations, but is the name for a constellation of elements shaped within global flows of capital, commodities, ideas, and images. In a sense, there is no such thing as nature, except, of course, there is. Braun goes on to caution against overestimating the power of these external flows, in other words, reminding us that globalization is not merely about non-local forces that touch down in specific sites. His point is that globalization works through local, social, and cultural conditions. It becomes an insider force, in other words. So, to explore ecocriticism's dance between the local and the general, let us turn to Harold Rennish's 2000 book, Tom Thompson's Shack. This book veers between many locations in BC's interior, as well as visiting Toronto, Ontario. But today, our time with this book will focus on Rennish's few brief visits to the local small community of Dead Man Valley. A poet who's also written several books of prose that are not easily categorized. Uh, Rennish is based in British Columbia and his work, it must be said, um, has seen a divided response from readers and critics. In Tom Thompson's Shack, a formerly experimental prose volume, Rennish tries to assess the distance between how he understands British Columbia on the one hand, and on the other hand, how he thinks the rest of Canada thinks of British Columbia, primarily thinking of, of Toronto, thinking of the art culture in Canada, and an urban techno-capitalist social system. The book's structure is fragmentary, neither novel nor memoir, nor collection of essays or stories. But Rennish takes great pains to situate many of the sections in very specific locations. In the section we're deal dealing with today, Rennish focuses on a nameless but highly specific plot of land that you see on screen here at the upper end of the evocatively named Dead Man Valley. In BC history, everything is connected and everyone is connected to everyone else. It is a huge place, but a very small town in, other, in, in some ways. And so Dead Man Valley is in some ways just another example of how geography and history intertwine here through the lenses of settler colonialism and the potential for decolonization. But that's not what we get from Rennish. Instead, when we come to Dead Man Valley with him, he tells it through the story of a, a Buddhist monk from California. A Buddhist monk from California arrived here in 1980 and tried to persuade the man who owned the property that you see on screen here um, that he should sell it to him. And the reason he should sell it to him um, is that the Rinpoche of his temple in California um, had decided that this location you see on screen was the center of the universe. Um, that this small knoll at the head of the Edman, Dead Man Valley near the 70 meter tall Dead Man Falls was the center of everything. The owner of the Vidat Lake Resort um, turned down uh, this offer to purchase. Um, the monks came back in larger numbers in 1984 and 1988, trying again, uh, but they never did succeed in purchasing it. This knoll has changed hands a few times since Rennish wrote this book, 
and the Vidette Lake Resort has seen its fortunes wax and wane over the years, and it's changed its name multiple times. But somehow this knoll has attained a minor celebrity of its own. Currently in the hands of the Vidette Lake Nature Retreat, occasionally the subject of either enthusiastic or deeply cynical YouTube vloggers, the center of the universe in the Dead Man Valley somehow persists as both an abstraction and a materiality at the same time. The concept sense of place has been central through ecocriticism's history, featuring in the titles of innumerable works like Ursula Heiss's wonderful study, Sense of Place and Sense of Planet. The challenge in teaching ecocriticism comes not just from conceptualizing and performing sense of place, but from recognizing the roles that our separate places play in how we come to this sense of place. And in Tom Thompson's shack in Rhenish's successive visits to encounters with of this center of the universe, I find a mirror from my own classroom struggles with place and with the places that students come from. The simple fact is that Rhenish repeatedly avoids describing this knoll, describing, depicting it instead as a prosaic but obvious location that still somehow he can't ever find on his own. Even after our fourth and final encounter with the center of the universe, its outlines remain imprecise somehow, conceptually powerful and yet still somehow sketched rather than fleshed out. Sunken between two winding ridges, Rhenish writes, the hill was a navel, cut in half by patterns of rainfall. The wet half was treed and dark, although recently logged. The other grassy and golden with light, repeating the larger pattern of the walls of the valley, which were in the same pattern of trees and grass. From above the knoll, you look for miles across parallel plateaus, as you see here, divided by three valleys with the darkness of Vidette Lake far below in the immediate valley bottom. <clears throat> I'm having a bit of a struggle because someone has managed to get the ability to annotate. So I need to stop sharing and then restart again so that um, I can progress from one side to slide to the next. Excuse me. No problem. Hmm. Okay. All right. Hopefully that will work. Um, sorry about that. As the book develops, Rhenish wanders ever further from Dead Man Valley through what seems an interminably low, low stakes tour of Southern Ontario, reading his new book of poetry to different audiences. But by the end of Tom Thompson's Shack, Rhenish echoes the same phrasing again when he comes to try to make sense of the gulf between rural Canada and the images of rural Canada that define certain elite art in this nation. As he writes, country and the beauty of the country are urban constructs. This country has its own images. People who live on the land consider themselves to be living at the center of the world. They are, of course. In some ways, no matter how far he travels, Rhenish never really leaves Dead Man Valley, even though it is only one of many important places for him, even though this is a place that he struggles to find when he's left to his own devices, he still somehow never leaves. When we look at Dead Man Valley, whether it's in literary representations or in the material world, our vision is confronted by layers. And so what, when it comes to, to reading equal we need to be trying to see through these layers and understand their intersections and their impacts. In this case, we see a simultaneously ancient and contemporary indigenous territory 
We see an exemplar of settler practices in this place currently known as British Columbia. We see an aestheticized literary portrait. We see a mostly new age semi mythic representation. We see a site for feelings. Or in Bruce Braun's words, this version of Dead Man Valley is shaped, among other things, by capital, commodities, ideas, and images, even though it is shaped also by water, by wind, by subterranean fungi, and by the power of trees. Dead Man Valley is located roughly 400 kilometers from Vancouver, British Columbia's largest city, but in a straight line distance only 200 kilometers. The valley is a, is a rift valley, so it feels like a canyon with plateaus and steep cliffs that differ geologically from each other on opposite sides of the valley. The river isn't large, but the topography of the valley means that a number of small lakes have formed there. The valley's largest lake, Snowhoosh, has been behind a dam since 1910 in order to irrigate the very short-lived orcharding community of Wallachine, which is a long story we don't have time for. Over the last 150 years, ranching has taken over much of the valley, although the Skeetcheston Reserve still remains, and their loyalty to the larger territory and larger region remains vital. Since the early 20th century, a large portion of the Dead Man Valley has been owned by the Bonnet family, which has had a large ranch there. I continue to learn the history of this ranch, um, so my comments about them are somewhat provisional here, but to a large extent, the Bonnet Ranch mirrors those in other parts of the province. They follow standard agricultural practices, which includes allowing cattle to graze high elevation grasslands and forests. Over the years, the ranch has built many miles of wooden rail fencing to control the movements of their cattle and to restrict the access of anyone who might want to use the land who isn't a cow. Certainly, they've managed their range well relative to other ranches in the area, but it's fair to say that they have control over a startlingly large volume of land within a deeply contested landscape. And when I say contested, I refer, of course, to the Ski Cheston. From the Ski Cheston's perspective, the larger landscape around this region is deeply and intimately storied because they've lived there since time immemorial. Archaeology can place them there more than 10,000 years ago. That's not as far back as the stories go. The reserve itself, though, the Ski Cheston Reserve, was established in 1877. The provincial government at that time refused to accept what the Ski Cheston were claiming, which was they ought to have land along the Thompson River. This was, this was land that the provincial government felt was too good for the Ski Cheston, and so naturally they passed a law preventing that. As a result, the Ski Cheston's deep knowledge of the larger region ended up being confined with claustrophobic effect to a small reserve on this one narrow valley. And so, as you see, complex forces intersect at Dead Man Valley. It's a useful example of a BC landscape for all of these reasons we've been talking about with decolonization and control and local authority and so on. But it is also a genuinely unique place. When Harold Rennish writes of it as the center of the universe, there is an element of humor in his portrait. We, we need to imagine a, a berobed Buddhist monk in the Canadian wilderness, a berobed Buddhist monk with a California accent in the Canadian wilderness, trying for spiritual reasons to purchase the title to a plot of land, whose title remains radically contested within Canadian land claims processes. Still, all these forces do genuinely intersect. So if there is a center of the universe, maybe this is one of them. But let's step away from place for a little while and talk about principle again, about the principles and pedagogies that we might be able to use as bridges between our institutions, between our literatures, uh, between instructors and, and students. Our title today is Teaching Places. And to restate some of what I was, is behind what I've been outlining, in the moment of eco-criticism, we bring to bear on our chosen text various schema, methods, and principles. As powerful as they are, they generally depend for their strength on their development in other soils and out of other texts. I was happy to hear 
uh, the name Lawrence Buell mentioned earlier, who's someone whose work I've admired for, for many years. Um, but I struggle to apply Lawrence Buell's um, criticism, which draws so strongly on 19th century American transcendentalism and 20th century, especially later 20th century American fiction. I struggle to apply that to the work that I'm doing in British Columbia. The question in the end is, is whether this approach, whichever approach we are using to eco-criticism, grants us access, appropriate access, useful access to the text and place that we're seeking to understand. Theoretically astute approaches need to be deployed in relation to specific places, specific literature, specific works of literature, or it's only a theory. But on the other hand, developing, deriving a kind of bespoke eco-criticism for a particular text or place puts us at risk of what Michael Cohen describes as narrative eco-criticism. Cohen's fear was that eco-criticism would become, as you see on screen, a place where literature meets popular prejudice and would have little more than sociological interest as the unexamined views of literature professors who are also amateur environmentalists. Uh, a phrase that, that cuts me to the heart, I have to say. But from Cohen's perspective and from the perspective of environmental theory more broadly, the worry is that someone like me tells stories about particular places and their species and the particulars of their landscape. Telling stories. However, what I'm trying to do is to tell stories to achieve theoretical objectives about the imaginative immersion of my students in places where they aren't. We are all in this together. I hope my students agree, and I hope that we all agree here today as well. And so I use both story and theory as a way of building bridges that help us stand together somewhere outside the mere classroom for practical effect, even if we are standing only metaphorically, even if we are not together as such. And so if I'm being honest, I use eco-criticism to build the people of a bioregion where we can remain connected to the region's past without being bound to nostalgia or solastalgia while being open to everywhere else. I want my students to develop a clear sense of relationships across place and time and species. All of these relationships that make any place such a complexly linked web. It is a grandiose intention that I shudder to say out loud. Plus, it's a doomed enterprise to some extent because I teach for myself only 30 students every couple of years in this specific area. The rest of my teaching is in other things, but never mind. That's my goal, building a culture. And I recognize beyond the simple arrogance of assigning myself this task, I recognize that I've embedded myself deeply through this in liberal fantasies of individual will. And I run the risk, therefore, of all this being not much more than a neoliberal distraction from the real work of decolonization, environmental justice. But in telling these stories, I am thinking all the time of anthropologist and ethnographer Julie Cruikshank. And what she wrote was that storytelling may be a universal human activity, but understanding what one hears requires close attention to local metaphor and local narrative conventions. It is not only about what is being told, it is about how it is being told. And that focused attentiveness to how something is told is the job of eco-criticism the job of English departments, the job of all of us interested in, in culture. So in my case, you know, I tell stories about flowers and about historic trade between indigenous nations in the bulbs of those flowers. I tell stories about barely edible wild berries that kind of taste terrible, except that you can make delicious preserves from them. I tell stories about big trees and small creeks and weathered cliffs. And all of these begin as my stories. But in being shared, they become our stories and may eventually maybe become your stories. As I said earlier, every reader is the center of their own world. Dead Man Valley, if I can tell its stories properly with the help of Harold Rennish, if I can help Harold Rennish tell the stories, then I can briefly represent in Dead Man Valley the center of a student's world. And with luck, they will return back to their own world with fresh eyes and a new way of seeing.
let's move to another location in British Columbia, not far from Dead Man Valley. This is the small community of Lytton. And as we do, we'll be shifting away from eco criticism uh, toward the related question of ecological grief. As it happens, Lytton, this small town here in the Fraser Canyon, was named after the 19th century British novelist Edward Buller Lytton, best known for the sentence that opens his novel Paul Clifford, It Was a Dark and Stormy Night. Until July 2021, Lytton was a small but more or less historically significant village in BC. Approximately 250 people lived in the village itself, another 800 on the half dozen nearby Lakapamuk reserves, and another 900 on rural properties outside the village boundaries. As you can see in the picture on the left, um, it is where two of British Columbia's largest rivers meet. The, top, the blue water of the Thompson River flows into the brown water of the Fraser River. Again, evidence of Indigenous occupation here dates back more than 10,000 years. And it was an important way station in settler history as well for the gold rush here that shaped so much of BC's early history, settler history. For various reasons, Lytton has a, a, a very small linchpin role in um, BC literary history, fiction, the history of BC fiction too. But we need to talk first about why I mentioned July 2021. So I'm not sure whether there was news coverage in India of Canada's high temperatures last year. Canada in general has a reputation for being not very warm. Um, and until last summer, no location in Canada had ever crossed the threshold of 45 degrees Celsius. On June 27th, 2021, Lytton, 100 kilometers from Dead Men Valley, the temperature reached 46.6. The next day, it reached 47.9. On June 29th, it reached 49.6 degrees, fully five degrees warmer than any temperature ever recorded in Canada. On June 30th, the next day, when the temperature was only 48 degrees, a fire ignited not far from town. And by the end of that day, the village of Lytton had been obliterated. All six reserves had been burned to the ground. And most rural properties in the area, of course, had also been destroyed. Reconstruction has not begun of Lytton, even though we are nine months past. As you can imagine, local residents have strong feelings about all of this. And one of these feelings naturally is grief. Primarily, this is from the experience of loss, the loss of homes and animals and belongings. But we need to explore, I think, the quite particular phenomena of ecological grief within the larger context of responses to disasters like this one and to disasters which have struck other places all around the world. I said that Lytton has a, an important place in literary history, and that's because for a variety of complicated reasons, its, uh, it's location in the Fraser Canyon means that writers interested in the interior traveled through Lytton. And some of them, particularly Ethel Wilson, set some of her fiction there. Her much beloved 1954 novel, Swamp Angel, passes through Lytton and views it as a, a deeply mythic territory. Sheila Watson's 1959 novel, The Double Hook, is set a little bit further north. But these two novels in, in all kinds of ways set the foundation for the entire subsequent trajectory of British Columbia fiction. Canadian culture has a kind of manly sense to it in what other countries think of it somehow in terms of being a frontier. British Columbia fiction is, is not that in certain ways. And it's because of Ethel Wilson and Sheila Watson and places like Lytton. And so I want to talk briefly about Teresa Kishkan's 2020 novel, The Weight of the Heart. The Weight of the Heart is built exactly on this understanding of these works and places. The book is set in 1974, and before the book opens, the main character's brother, an archaeologist, drowns in the Fraser River. His body washes up in Lytton. The main character is working on her master's thesis, on her MA thesis, on the fiction of Ethel Wilson and Sheila Watson. And so she's been meaning to travel to Lytton 
to retrace the footsteps of these authors and to see where their characters went. But now she has another reason as well. And so the novel is Isabel's attempt to make sense of the fiction that predates her by 20 years, to make sense of her brother's death and his life, to make sense of the place that matters so much to these people. Kishken's main character walks the streets and paths of Lytton, drives the same highways, drives the same back roads. And in all sorts of ways, The Weight of the Heart is therefore exactly the kind of book that can bring together important strands for my students when we talk about BC literature, Canadian literature, and the environmental humanities. And this is because of Kishken's narrative decision to overlay so precisely her main character's personal grief with the ecological grief that all of us attentive to climate and to, to changes in nature should be experiencing. Her book, of course, came out one year before the town was obliterated by fire. When I use the term ecological grief, I do so thinking of Ashley Consolo and her work with the Labrador Inuit communities. There are other useful terms to consider in this respect, such as Sarah Jaquette Ray's concept of climate anxiety, um, as well as Kate Sandilands' excavation of the term depression. But to me and to my students, Consolo's thinking seems to offer the sharpest analysis of the challenges we face in living through the Anthropocene and the clearest perception that still, somehow, opportunities for hope continue to persist, that we have the ability to make such opportunities. In my senior undergraduate courses in the environmental humanities, we consistently find ourselves entering what Consolo has described as an unprecedented form of mourning. In speaking of her own encounters with the ecological grief of the Inuit she's working with in Labrador, she stresses the novelty and the isolation of what she and they were going through. Essentially, she was interviewing elders of, of different communities there and asking them how things had changed. And it was intended initially as a kind of record of, of landscape level change. But what became immediately clear is that everyone cried. And that these serious um, individuals uh, were deeply, deeply bereft at having to tell the story of the changes of, in their places. And so what we see on screen is sort of the, the distillation of, of how Ashley Consolo came to feel during this process, that she was consumed. She couldn't figure out how to atone. She could not figure out how not to be crushed by the weight of the stories that she was telling and the emotions that she was having shared with her. My hope in my classes is that, is always that my students are able to obtain information through their readings outside the fields of literature and literary criticism when they are reading geography, conservation biology, flood dynamics, the recent release of, of another um, United Nations climate change report. We do come away informed for sure, but consistently as well, we build in what has to be an openly shared set of feelings which are variable and diverse in their operations and details, yes, but they are shared. And uppermost in my mind always is the simple fact that for the point of classroom exercises, I am making my students confront and engage with what Consolo describes as the pain and daily realization of human and ecological suffering. My students think they know what they're signing up for when they enroll in this course, but strong feelings are unpredictable. And these days I've come to understand much more intimately that I've exposed through these practices a great many students to genuine risk as a result of the, the emotions that they, they encounter. Sense of place is a complicated thing. When place itself changes as radically as it did at Lytton in the summer of 2021, there can be no doubting that this, the sense itself has to change along with the place as has been articulated in work on the concept of shifting baseline syndrome. So if literature before the fire about literature can represent so much BC, 
What does it mean now that Lyric is being abused as a direct result <laughs> about propagandists? Climate change. We uh, request attendees to please mute themselves. <laughs> I would like to bring this to the <laughs> notice <laughs> of the department. Are we back again? Yes. I would like to bring this to the notice of the IT department. Can they attend these to the notice of the IT department? I'll just start speaking more loudly. Uh, yeah. Miss Paru Sone, please mute your audio. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you, sir. You can carry on. So you can thank you continue. So sorry for that. No, no, that's that's fine. It's uh, online conferences have their own special challenges. Um, so my question is: literature about Lytton can represent so much about BC, this tiny little place. Well, what does it mean that Lytton has now been obliterated as a direct result of anthropogenic climate change? And what does this literal physical erasure from the landscape mean for literature and for literary studies? So the fire that obliterated Lytton did not stretch to the Dead Man Valley. However, a different fire did, which was called the Sparks Lake Fire after the location of its ignition. And what you see on screen here is the same waterfall that you saw before, except that it is now surrounded by a deeply charred forest. Much like Lytton, Dead Man Valley was almost entirely raised by forest fires in the summer of 2021. Roughly 9,000 square kilometers burned across British Columbia last year. This particular fire is believed to have been caused when someone deliberately set fire to a vehicle a vehicle that was parked at an illegal operation where marijuana was being grown. Hasn't been confirmed, but there is a kind of poetry in that, I suppose. The grasses will return at the center of the universe in Dead Men Valley, because that's what grass does. It's too early to say what will happen to all these trees. Douglas firs have evolved a very thick bark, which is designed to protect the trees cambium from fire, as long as the fire doesn't get too hot. But fire functions differently now than it did when Douglas firs were evolving. An evolution which occurred in an environment which was heavily shaped by burn practices followed by indigenous peoples. In other words, indigenous peoples burned the terrain and Douglas firs evolved to survive grass fires. Fire prevention policies have meant that a great deal of fuel has accumulated in BC forests. And so the firs generally cannot survive these fires. As a result, the Dead Man Valley's forests have been incinerated. Its creeks have been choked with ash consistently since last summer, which is getting worse now that the snow melt is washing the remaining residues into the valley bottom. And even more seriously, the, the steep slopes of this valley are collapsing unpredictably but dramatically because the fires were so hot. And so this place has changed. But so far, the sense of place itself has not changed yet for either the Ski Cheston or for the Bonnet family. And so they're experiencing powerful, powerful reactions to these landscape level changes in this small place. I do not know whether the Ski Cheston and the Bonnets are experiencing the same feelings or whether they have the same feelings about their own feelings. But to return to where we started this paper, the center of the universe last summer was destroyed by fire driven by climate change caused by human activity. The topographical cues which drew the California Buddhists to this location remain, but it's far from clear what will happen next at this spot, whether it will become a forest again or whether it will be enter a kind of grassland succession. At the end of Tom Thompson's shack, Harold Renish ends by insisting that the land holds a special power. He's not speaking of a specific place, but he's talking about how to build a uniquely BC culture from relations with the land. And so what he says at the end of the book is the, the work of a fly fisherman 
fashioning a grasshopper out of deer hair walking miles along the cut banks of the Thompson River north of Lytton, among the old abandoned villages with their graves and dead fruit trees, casting out through the blue air so the hopper lies like a breath upon cool water, is the basis for building a culture. There was a time that this phrasing genuinely excited me with my own experiences fishing for trout in places like this and camping and learning the history of the, of the place. But many of the Thompson's cut banks north of Lytton have been radically reshaped by the severe flooding which happened in November 2021 when Canada saw the heaviest rains that it had ever seen in its history. The abandoned villages that Renish mentions here, as well as Lytton itself, and some properties in Deadman Valley have burned to the ground. The steelhead salmon that this fisherman is seeking, which returned up the Fraser River past Lytton to the Dead Man River annually for thousands of years, are on the verge of extinction now. However, the basis for building a culture remains and always remains in spite of this apocalypse. And it is genuinely an apocalypse. I've been talking today about a local one, but there is a larger apocalypse at work. The sense of place survives through pain, through grief, through rage. And if we are mindful ecologically, we can carry on empowered by the drive to imagine a future that respects the past. This talk today has been, I acknowledge, tied intensively to places very far from the Rajiv Gandhi National University of Law. I do not know your places. And I do not presume to direct you in your own responses to the local and global disasters that are threatening the very existence of the human species. I hope, however, that the local lessons that have so concerned and consumed my students and me have been able to assume some general form for you here. And I wish you all very well with this conference. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much for that lovely address. I would now like to call ma'am for the vote of thanks. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Richard Pickett. It was a pleasure listening to you. And I remember uh, once uh, 48 hours back when we met discussing whether the places in Canada would be of concern to the Indian audience or not. I think um, just be as an evidence uh, and the people attending, you know, the conference uh, probably are quite interested and as already remarked, you know, the places we, we share this common earth and therefore, you know, we have uh, these concerns, you know, whether uh, literature is raising these concerns. Again, uh, a lot has been said about uh, storytelling by Father Nellis also. And uh, you also mentioned uh, so, so much in great detail uh, all how close attention to these stories can be um, really effective in molding, shaping uh, our eco-consciousness. And that is what is required. And yes, I would also now uh, like to mention here that Sir has um, researched on uh, nature writing and he made a special mention that uh, he made sure that he did not travel to the places <laughs> Uh, looking into his responsibility as an individual uh, to not contributing to the pollution that is taking place at a large scale everywhere. So we are really grateful to you, uh, Dr. Richard Pickard, for enlightening us about the places, what literature has to say. And I hope uh, everyone you know, that gets registered with us and, and this is not the only time that we have you here, though you have not been here to RGNUL, but uh, definitely um, we look forward, maybe someday when you decide uh, to be a part of RGNUL, you travel and come this part of the world. So um, again, you know, we, this is quite evident that the time for seeking any global solutions is really running out. And each one of us, as every speaker in the in this inaugural session, has already you know focused upon this. And I uh, quote Pope uh, Francis on this. He says, "The time for seeking global solutions is running out. We can find suitable solutions only if we act together 
in agreement. And I think the purpose of this inaugural session and this conference is to bring this kind of an agreement and raise that level of consciousness so that we can take care of Mother Earth and live here in a very uh, pure same manner, like uh, Dr. Adarsh Palvig was also making a mention that the word pollution is not a very, uh, say, ancient word. It is a recent word because people were associated with purity in those times. And uh, impurity is something, you know, uh, which we are contributing to the Earth these days. I extend uh, my thanks and I'm grateful to the collaborators, the uh, Punjab Pollution Control Board, Patiala, Shastri Indo-Canadian Institute, New Delhi, and Assam uh, Don Bosco University for collaborating with us and making us reach out to an audience who is already working on these environmental issues. I'm extremely grateful to you, Dr. Richard Pickett, for delivering the keynote address. And yes, uh, you might get to hear yourself uh, sometime. I'll share the link when we upload it on our official uh, YouTube. So this will be available there. So, uh, and we would love to hear you again and again. And hear everyone, you know, my colleagues sitting here, uh, Dr. Sanya, Dr. Kamalji, uh, Ms. Lafri, we have thoroughly enjoyed um, your speech, every word of it. And yes, uh, I have to say uh, a special thanks to Ms. Reshma Rana Verma for having coordinated and you know uh, reaching out to Dr. Richard Pickard. And I know now Dr. Richard will not take uh, a long time, but he will quickly revert to us whenever we call him for another uh, deliberations on any other issue, whether literature or climate change. We are really impressed, sir. And on behalf of Rajiv Gandhi National University of Law, I would like to thank all the participants, all the distinguished speakers, academicians, the IT unit, uh, our GNL faculty, faculty from all different institutes in India and abroad for joining us on these deliberations. And I hope the link is going to be the same. Whenever you wish to, you can just click the join button and join us for deliberations on literature, environment, and climate change. I'm also grateful to Dr. Prachi Paul, you know, for apprising our students and the audience on several issues. She very relevantly mentioned that uh, one thing emerges out of the other, and today is World Health Day. Only if we have a pollution-free environment can we have good health. Thank you so much, everyone. Special thanks to our worthy Vice Chancellor, Professor G.S. Bajpai, because he is the guiding and steering force, and he keeps on encouraging us to hold uh, such seminars and conferences on these important issues. I have also to thank Dr. Saiket Banerjee and his students for joining us very punctually this morning. And yes, what to say of Dr. Adarsh Palvik, who personally, uh, he made it very clear that he would be in person here to be a part of the deliberation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. This brings us to the end of this inaugural session. Uh, we would now be breaking for a short tea break for 10 minutes, post which the sessions can begin. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>